I heard that the music uh, stopped and we can start our panel. Welcome everyone, my name is Teresa Quinte and I'm an assistant professor at the European Center on Privacy and Cybersecurity at Maastricht University. And as you might have guessed, I'm the moderator of this panel today with the name uh, Ending the Privacy of Those Who Are pro uh, Protected or Effectively Safeguarding Children Against Online Sexual Abuse. So as you probably assumed, uh, we will speak about the regulation on preventing and combating child sexual abuse that the Commission proposed in May last year. And that proposal lays down uh, rules that would allow uh, national authorities to mandate uh, service providers to detect, blog, delete and report known and new uh, child sexual abuse material, including the solicitation of children, so-called grooming. It's a very complex uh, process that I will not go into now, but uh, there are a lot of reports and opinions online that you can easily find. Uh, but the proposal would apply to virtually all online platforms and interpersonal communication services and would have an impact on practically all online activity. And as probably everyone of you knows, the proposal is subject, subject of massive controversy, mainly because it threatens end-to-end -end encryption and because it could lead to a situation in which our private communication would no longer be confidential but scan for potential child sexual abuse material and grooming. Of course, it is still a proposal and we need to see uh, what the negotiations will bring. Also now with the upcoming Spanish presidency and what will happen during the negotiations and whether other developments will also have an impact on the outcome of the proposal. But for now, we look at it uh, as it is and uh, the controversies around it. So our panel brings together uh, speakers from civil society, from the industry and child uh, protection organizations. And the panelists will discuss concerns around the proposal and what the proposed rules, uh, what impact the proposed rules will have on the privacy of users and those, uh, the, the rights of the children, including uh, their rights to data protection and privacy. And uh, I will briefly introduce the speakers and then we will go right into the discussion. And uh, as the room is very full, uh, we will leave a lot of time also in the end um, for questions from the audience. So um, on the left, my left side uh, is Alexander Hanf, who is a privacy expert with a 30 year career in technology as a computer scientist and for the past 15 years, he focused entirely on privacy, data protection, cybersecurity, and data ethics. Then we have uh, Arda Gerkins, who has been active in the fight against child sexual abuse since 2002 and leads an organization uh, that combats online harm and uh, sexual child abuse. She's also a senator and vice president of the Dutch Senate. And she has two children, which I realized is always a very important uh, aspect to highlight in this discussion. Uh, because otherwise you might not know what you're talking about. Then we have on my right uh, Thomas van der Weyck, who is a privacy policy manager at Meta. And before that, he uh, worked at the European Parliament and has extensive experience with EU uh, legislation on privacy, such as the GDPR, the e-privacy uh, directive, the DMA, DSA, and of course, uh, the proposal that we will speak about. And last but not least, uh, we have Luisa Di Giacomo, who is a lawyer and privacy consultant uh, dealing with data protection and cybersecurity, and is also founder and chair uh, woman of Cyber Academy, and a spokeswoman for the Italian National Anti-Cyberbullying Center. And she's very engaged also in raising awareness uh, of privacy and data protection issues to uh, young people. Of course, and as you might have seen in the printed uh, version of the program, we also invited the Commission, but unfortunately they withdrew their participation on a rather short notice, which is very surprising because I was moderating uh, a panel on a similar topic in December and was approached by the Commission uh, why they were not invited. And of course it's also a pity uh, because we would have liked to have their view repre represented in this panel, and I have to say it's difficult to find uh, people who can defend it. So coming to the discussion, <laughs> <laughs> the, 
there will be many issues, of course, that we will not be able to touch upon during this panel, because there's simply not time for that. Um, hopefully, one, some of them will be raised during the Q&A uh, with the audience. But during the panel, uh, we will look at the privacy and data protection related con concerns uh, that arise with the proposal, including the ones of children and survivors of abuse, and try to touch upon some of the underlying problems and possible solutions, whether technological solutions can actually solve the problem, and of course the role of the service providers uh, that will be concerned by the proposal, what is currently being done in order to tackle the problem, and whether they should and how take more responsibility. And how the panel is structured is that I will uh, ask questions to the panelists. There will be a few minutes for e everyone to reply to the questions, and at the end, we will leave questions for the audience. So my first question goes to Alexander. Can you say something about the changes that the proposal will bring when comparing it to what we have at the moment, the so-called interim regulation? And where do you see the key problems of the proposal in connection with the rules under the e-privacy directive? So the, the derogation or the, the, the temporary regulation as, an, as it's now being called, uh, it was problematic as it was, and, and I fought it for approaching two years with uh, various politicians um, in the European Parliament, um, Patrick Breyer, for example. Uh, and we had a, a lot of uh, studies done and some consultations. We commissioned a report from a retired Court of Justice judge uh, who made it very clear that this would not meet the requirements of proportionality and necessity under EU law. Um, and this was just with the derogation, which only made these provisions voluntary, okay? So this, this allowed companies like Google, Facebook, et cetera, these big platforms to be able to scan communications using a technology called photo DNA or, or similar technologies in order to be able to um, find these child sexual abuse uh, media within their environments and do something about it. Um, this was a problem under Article uh, 15 of the, the e-privacy directive with regards to confidentiality communications, uh, which um, all our communications are supposed to be confidential in the EU, uh, which is generally a good thing, um, but the, the, the derogation made that uh, something which is not possible nowadays. Um, but the, the new proposal by the Commission is much, much broader. Uh, they've introduced detection orders which will require service providers to, to undertake certain activities to try and find this material on their networks. This is going to lead to mass surveillance of literally billions of communications every single day. If you consider that the European Union consists of around 500 million individuals and all of the communications that we conduct digitally on our phones, on our social media networks, etc., all of these will be scanned as a result of this regulation or this proposed regulation. Um, on top of that, the scope of the scanning has been extended to not just include images, but also to include um, conversations, so what they would consider as grooming. This becomes much more complex. It's going to involve the use of artificial intelligence in many cases to be able to do this. Um, in an age where we're now starting to see the very real risks of artificial intelligence, such as uh, deep fakes, uh, as we saw earlier this week, wiping $500 billion off the stock market um, before it's discovered that they weren't actually real, uh, and all the problems that we come there. And we, just this week, we've had um, uh, Sam Altman from OpenAI uh, who was originally calling for regulation in Congress a couple of weeks ago, now saying that if the EU AI Act goes through in its current stance, then he will draw his product from the EU. <clears throat> so we, we know there are problems with AI. We know there's going to be significant issues as a result. We know from research that there's a large number of false positives uh, as a result of the technology being used currently, and this isn't going to change. This is only going to get worse as we move forward, simply because of the number of communications which are going to be scanned. We know the efficacy of this is incredibly low from the perspective of how many prosecutions uh, actually occur as a result of the, the surveillance of these communications. We know there's an issue from proportionality and necessity, the bedrock of EU law, the, the very things that we base our constitution, our charter of fundamental rights on, uh, and the, and the e European Union as well, on this, uh, this, this, this basis of proportionality and necessity. Uh, and we know that this is going to destroy families, this is going to lead to people who are completely innocent of crime um, being arrested for things that they've never done. And then we have the emergence of deep fakes as well, as I said, uh, which is going to make the mess even worse, because at this point we get to a situation where people get targeted. They have images created which are completely fake in order to target them. This could be po po uh, political persons, this could be regular individuals and citizens, uh, in order to, to, to have them arrested and, and have them punished for something that they've never done. 
Um, and I've been working in privacy and, and technology for a very long time, but I have a lot of skin in this game. I'm a child sexual abuse survivor. My entire family was destroyed through child sexual abuse. It took me over 20 years to, to find justice for the abuse that occurred in, in my life. So it's something which is deeply personal to me, and, and as a privacy advocate as well, I cannot sit back and see the fundamental rights which we rely on as abuse victims and survivors, the, the, the right to communicate confidentiality, uh, the right to be able to, to talk to people and obtain the support we need in safe and confidential environments, the right to report the perpetrators of the crimes against us in safe and confidential environments. This evaporates if we have the situation where we now start scanning all these communications. So not only are we harming the, the citizens of the EU who are, who, who are innocent of any crimes, we're also harming the very people that this proposal is claiming to try and protect. And we're doing more violence to them, we're having more of an impact on their dignity. So this is a very serious issue. It's one which the, the, the original derogation went through very, very quickly because it's a very taboo topic. No politician wants to be seen not to be supporting children, protecting children. Um, and as a result, we end up rushing these pieces of legislation through with very little thought or oversight, and the consequences are dire. Thank you so much for this. And uh, you mentioned also the prosecutions, and we often hear about investigations, about children saved, about suspects that were detected. But if we then look at the actual numbers on prosecutions, final judgments, they are either non-existent or not very clear. So, Arda, where would be the proof of an evidence-based effectiveness of the proposed measures and also their necessity? Yes, so I'm, I'm not from the Dutch police, but I can speak a little bit about it because I know that uh, at least the Dutch police doesn't uh, support this proposal. Uh, because indeed, of course, um, images are detected, which might be illegal, but illegal doesn't mean that it's child sexual abuse. But we tend to forget that the majority of the images that are being shared um, and figures, there are several new um, researches that show that about 50 to 60 percent of the grooming or the asking of images is done by youth. So please bear in mind that we're criminalizing our youth by doing that. Um, uh, many of the images don't have any clue in it. Uh, I literally heard a, a police officer say when, and please excuse me if I'm a bit too explicit, when there we were speaking about an image where just the vagina was to be seen, it's useless, he said, can't do anything with it, there's no clue in it. So, you know, <coughs> Uh, the European Commission tends to throw around lots of numbers um, trying to emphasize how difficult or how severe the problem is. But it doesn't say anything on uh, is it one image or is it uh, an image that's being researched like millions of times? Uh, is it indeed child sexual abuse? Does it have a perpetrator uh, as the ones that you're talking about? Or is it minors uh, sending images to each other? And, but all these conversations, all these images will be looked into. And the, and the, the, the bad thing about it is that um, if you look at the whole com European Union, there are countries where they just have one police officers, uh, officer working on child sexual abuse imagery. So they don't have big teams. Uh, the Netherlands, they've just, they're trying to get another 60 to 80 extra officers to trying to do something with the enormous amount of um, reports coming from NECMEC to the Netherlands. Uh, about 50,000 of them are, are still waiting on the shell. And what I fear is that if you have that many reports, uh, first of all, you will clock the system because you obviously <laughs> told you know how many reports we will get. It, there will be into billions, uh, and you can't assess them all. So you would then have to prioritize and. I, you know, there's no police officer who can sit on something that is suspicious, but he can't do anything about it. So they will try to do something to diminish risks of this person who might be perpetrating or could be perpetrating. And that would mean that maybe their rights are denied in a way that they will never find out. They can't assess the internet. Maybe they won't get a job. But they don't know why. Because somewhere somebody decided that, you know, there's there's been a sign signal that there might be child abuse. So in the end, I think if you do scan for this kind of material, you should never use it as prosecution material or material to, to find the perpetrators. You should only do such a thing to clean up the internet, which will also help by combating online child sexual abuse. Because I'd like to 
emphasize again that the majority of people who are watching this material uh, don't have any sexual preferences for children, but they're just watching it because, you know, it's there, it's available. Uh, for some people it's very shocking when I mention this, but it's, it's actually just a few uh, percentage of the people who are viewing this material who actually have a sexual interest in children. It's more of the enormous amount of porn online that will make men, mostly men, but also women, uh, find more extreme material. And extreme material means child sex abuse material, but it's also sexual activity with the animals or rape videos or gangbang rape videos. All these kind of horrible things we don't want, but they need because they're not excited with the regular porn or adult industry that we have. So taking this material down will prevent more demand uh, and already I think would be really sufficient but to use it in proper prosecute cases uh, I, I totally agree with Alexander it will lead to people being uh, innocent and, and, and prosecuted. Thank you so much. So we were looking at numbers and you mentioned NECMEC uh, which is uh, the American Child Protection Organization that also cooperates very much with uh, EU authorities. Um, and if we look at the numbers provided by NECMEC in 2022, out of 29 million reports uh, were submitted, uh, out of 29 million reports, 22 million were submitted by Meta alone. And Meta argues that uh, many of those reports uh, were submitted more than once, sometimes even up to six times. And so my next question, of course, goes to Thomas. Where do you see the risk of over-reporting if the new ro rules become applicable? Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much, and thank you for uh, having me on this uh, very important uh, topic. Um, so indeed, it's important to understand why, um, as Ada already mentioned, why people share uh, CSAM and what is the context in which this happens, right? So we have done um, research into uh, this matter and in uh, one sample we found that um, on Facebook and Instagram more than 90%, so 90% was the same or similar, similarly looking uh, content that was being shared and uh, copies of only six videos uh, six different videos made up um, of over half of the exploitative uh, content that we uh, had to report to NECMEC because we have an uh, obligation under US law to uh, report those to uh, NECMEC. So, of course, every share and reshare is one too many and re-victimizes the victim. But it is important to understand that of all of those numbers, that those are not individual um, pieces of content, but often um, reshares. Um, and we've also found in a different uh, research that um, over 75% of CSAM sharing is not done um, because of uh, malicious intent, but um, moreover because of uh, poor humor, because some group chats think it's funny to share some, something like that for shock effect. Um, and others because of outrage, because they see something that was maybe shared in poor humor or for other reasons and share it again to show like how, how appalled people are by that or because maybe it was actually um, maliciously shared as well. So there are many, many occasions where this material is being shared for other uh, reasons as well. So that's not to understate um, the severity of malicious uh, intense sharing, but just to put the numbers into uh, perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's very important also to take this into account when we look at numbers that are being provided in order to uh, justify these kind of measures being proposed and uh, regulating something. If we look at the numbers on the one hand of actual prosecutions, but at the same time at the numbers that are maybe sometimes a bit conflated as well. Uh, but with that, I'm coming uh, to my next speaker, uh, Luisa. Uh, could you speak a bit about the underlying structural problems that exist and um, that you also encounter during your work? Uh, you, you're working with uh, children to ra wa raise awareness um, and the existing prevention uh, strategies. Yes, thank you, Teresa, and thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very honored and happy to be here this afternoon. Um, I uh, stay on the other side of the barricades because I work directly with families 
and children and parents who report uh, abuse and who report episodes of uh, cyberbullying. So not only um, sexual abuse, but all, all kind of abuse involving children and uh, underage people. And um, well, the main problem I must face with is mm, awareness. And uh, uh, the thing that the problem that mm, people don't want to report episodes. Uh, people tend to underestimate the dangers connected with uh, uh, the web and connected with the uh, uh, active or also a passive presence uh, on the web. And when I talk about passive presence on the web, I mean uh, the phenomenon of uh, what, what I call the shorenting. So the, um, uh, this uh, habit of parents to share photos of their children, even when they are uh, very, very, um, the new, from their newborn to until uh, every, every, in the everyday life. Um, so the main problem is this, that they don't understand dangers and they don't understand uh, uh, what kind of risks they can, uh, they can encounter when, uh, when they go on the web. Um, children uh, are um, ashamed of what they write or what they share because what we must mm, face is that when uh, an episode of uh, abuse, uh, generally speaking, I mean cyberbullying or also sexual abuse happen, not all the times, but most of the time, it happens because uh, the under the, the, the child, the under I, I, I'm not talking about very little children, of course, but uh, like uh, 13, 13 years old, 14 years old um, children um, chat and stay online and on the social in an active way. So they are uh, active uh, parts of this kind of episodes because they don't, of course, they don't understand and they don't feel the, they don't feel the, the, the danger. And when they arrive to understand, when they uh, understand finally, it's most of the time too late. So um, I have mothers that called me, they called the, anti, the National Anti-Cyberbullying Center uh, saying uh, um, intimate photos of my uh, 11 years old or 13 years old daughter are online because she willingly put them because the, the, so this is a very uh, th this this is a problem this is a very important and very uh, crucial problem because uh, has a, they don't understand that they are they are doing something very dangerous then they are ashamed of report they are ashamed to report uh, to their parents and they are ashamed to report, and then the parents are uh, not so willingly to report to the authorities. So uh, this is the main structural problem uh, I, I encounter in my, in, my, in my work. And then uh, um, the thing is that um, normally um, children sexual abuse are committed uh, uh, within the family or within the very inner circle of people that uh, children know. Um, the thing is that now it is not uh, children, children uh, don't have to go out of their home to encounter monsters and to encounter people who can abuse them. They can stay at home in their own bedroom and encounter monsters. So this is the, the, the main problem that I, uh, staying on, on the other side of the barricades, I have to deal with. Thank you so much for this input. And yes, a large percentage of uh, abuse and sexual abuse against children is being or happens within families and very close circles. But so the problem would also be if we have this large percentage and now taking aside uh, the problem online, whether the proposed rules will actually lead to a situation in which the, this reliance on uh, service providers and technology will shift the way uh, the, the attention from the structural problems that exist and from preventative work while not actually leading to help many of the victims. And this question goes to Ida. That's a very good question because it reminds me of um, a post, I think I read something of uh, Mrs. Johansson who uh, spoke about um, I think she referred even to the Netherlands, um, 
a father who was abu abusing his baby and which was detected by images who were detected online. And then she said something, well, you can't help this child with awareness, which I find a very stupid remark because in, well, I, I actually think uh, that might not be the case because the awareness is, uh, if you look at the offline abuse, um, I, I think you, I mean, I see, I see the public, I, I, I'm going to tell you now, you all know a child that's being abused at this moment. And if you really think about it, you probably come to mind to some child, but you just don't want to talk about it because the accusation of such a thing would be so bad that if, if you would speak that, uh, if you would say that aloud, it might have such a great consequences because uh, the, the worst of the worst thing you can be is a sexual, um, a predator in this uh, in this world, and I would say this is not really helpful because it makes us close our eyes for the things that are happening around us. So indeed, I think in real life we could also have seen this father abusing his baby, and there will be and will have been people around who could have seen those signals. We don't need the online world for that. Um, but next to that, um, and ex exactly what you were talking about, there's a lot going on online, and we tend to forget that children really voluntarily go online because they're sexually curious. That's another thing we don't want to talk about. We tend to think, you know, children get sexually active once they're 14 or something. Well, I'll tell you, they're, they're the, 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 the first image that we have of a human being uh, touching themselves uh, is when it was in the womb. So it, it's physically already there. And we have a lot of people outside uh, this world who go online and try to uh, appeal to the sexual curiosity. So you have websites like Omigo, Chat Roulette, and if you talk to, to a 10 year old, they all know you're gonna find a naked man there within minutes. And that's really exciting to do so and to see so. Uh, and uh, they, they're not aware of the fact that this guy will then lure them into maybe swiftly show something, put your t-shirt up or uh, uh, get your pants down, and they, they don't realize that it's being videotaped from the other side of their photos are taken. And I actually think that awareness here could be so helpful because parents don't know that these guys are out there. Parents have no idea. The parents leave their six, seven years old uh, uh, children alone online. With it's, <laughs> it's not a, a world for children, it's a world for grown-ups. So you can't leave your kids there alone. And I think awareness is something we need first and most of all to tackle this problem, because uh, uh, I, I, let me end by, by, by telling one. Th I, I know I once was chatting. We also have a, oh, excuse me. Also have a helpline for with a guy who said a boy who said, yeah. When I was really young, I'm 12 years old now, but I was really young. I once went to Amigo, and I, you know I did some things online, and now I'm kind of worried. Do you think? Do you think they will have made a video out of it? And I didn't want to tell him, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they did, because that will harm him more than not knowing. Uh, and now, if we start this legislation, they will know. And I think in the end, that will do more harm than sometimes it's better not to know what happened with your images. Thank you so much for this perspective. And also speaking about uh, effectiveness of uh, the proposed rules, and this question will go to Alexander. Where do you see the potential of these perpetrators simply moving to platforms that uh, will not be covered by the regulation or which will choose not to enforce the rules? Uh, it's a really interesting question and, and I have some experience of this. Back in 1992 to 1997, I, I launched the first online platform for uh, prevention of paedophilia on the internet um, because I wanted to do something um, as an, as an off the back of my own experiences to try and understand what I had gone through and my family had gone through and, and, and how other people are going through this and how we can try and prevent this. So, so I set up a support group and I worked with law enforcement all over the world helping to track down people who are distributing child pornography uh, in chat rooms. This is in the very early days of, of the internet. Um, so in chat rooms and other environments, um, dis the, the distribution of these images. And I worked on a number of cases, including the Orchid Club, which was one of the biggest um, child, child pornography rings uh, which were busted in the, in the 90s. Um, and one of the things which became very clear to me was, A, the police really didn't have any understanding of the technologies. 
So they weren't able to effectively police it, and they didn't know uh, where these uh, images were being distributed. Uh, and B, whenever you have a situation where there's a clampdown in one place, it simply moves to another place. Uh, or it moves to another technology. So things like steganography, for example, where the images are hidden inside other images um, in, as a way to, to obfuscate and mask uh, the distribution of these images. And we will see exactly the same thing now with, with the, the dark web and other technologies, the ability to be able to create apps very, very quickly, especially now in the age of AI where, where the, you know, the LLMs can write the code for you. Okay, So you can deploy an app now with encryption in literally a matter of minutes using uh, artificial intelligence. So the, the, the really serious criminals who are doing this will simply move to other platforms where they're out of jurisdiction of these laws or these platforms aren't implementing or, or meeting their legal obligations under these laws. So the real criminals, the real harmful aspect of this, other, as opposed to the, the innocent sharing of information or, or images from, from children themselves as a matter of their sexual curiosity, this will prevail. And this will get worse because it will become more difficult to detect. So it will lead to more harm. Because at this point, it becomes incredibly difficult for the police to investigate these environments because they don't know they exist. So how do we move forward then? What, what, what is the next step? How are we going to tackle this problem? It's a cat and mouse chase, and it's not going anywhere. And it, it really incensed me to think how much money have we spent over the past five years lobbying and developing th this plan, first with the, with the derogation and now with the proposal. Yet how, if you compare that to how much money we put into researching why this abuse occurs in the first place, as opposed to just dealing with the consequences, there's almost no money provided to research these issues. I studied psychology 30 years ago and, and was looking at this particular issue, uh, prevention of paedophilia on the internet, and I struggled. Uh, I, I was interviewing um, offenders who, who had been rehabilitated and asking them why they offended, what it was that drove them to do the things that they do. And they didn't believe they were doing anything wrong. They believed this was normal behavior. And when you look at the media, when you look at the entertainment industry, when you look at the fashion industry, the advertising industry, with the hypersexualization of minors or young adults, it's clear to see that this, we are normalizing this problem, right? So this makes it even worse. And I said to my, my psychology professor, I said, I'm finding it really difficult to, to discuss this and to move forward with my dissertation uh, because of the deep impact it's having on me and my trauma. Uh, and he said to me, he said, you, you know, if you're walking down a canal and you see a baby in the canal, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to save the baby. So, OK, so you walk another 100 meters down the canal and you see another baby in the canal. What are you going to do? I said, I'll jump in and save the baby. He says, well, you keep doing this and eventually you're going to drown because you're going to run out of energy and you, you're going to run out of strength and you're not going to be able to save these babies anymore. He said, do you not think it would be more suitable and more, more uh, advantageous to go back up the canal and find out why these babies are in the water in the damn first place? Right? So we need to investigate, we need to research what leads people to offend in this way. This problem is as old as society. We, we hear statistics that it's increasing. It's not increasing, it's just easier to see now, particularly with these measures which allow us to you know, snoop on people's communication. But this isn't something new. This has existed for as long as civilization. It's documented throughout history. You know, it's celebrated in some historical context. In different parts of the world, this is actually a rite of passage. If we go to, uh, there's an African tribe where fellatio uh, of the, the, the tribal chief by the boys as they reach a certain age is a rite of passage. It's how they go from being a boy to a man. It's not considered as taboo. It's not considered as, as, as abuse. This is part of their society for as long as that society has existed. These are the tribes, uh, African tribes. So, you know, even when you look at it in that context, it's not a straightforward issue. It's not always a case that this is abuse. Uh, we look at it as abuse because of our Western values and our Western culture, but that clearly isn't the case on the global exactly. scale. Thank you so much. And uh, well, now I have a more <coughs> straightforward question to Thomas, which is about the aspect that it has been argued that it will never come to detection orders because mitigation measures will be put into place. And so it's really not likely that they will, that it will ever come to the scanning. But realistically, um, and also looking at some of the provisions that are, could be said to be very weak, how realistic is it that uh, it could lead to generalized monitoring of communications? Yeah, thank you. So I think, um Foremost, uh, I would like to say that we do feel the responsibility to protect uh, minors on our platform, and we do so, and we have several safety programs for that, um, and this includes uh, regarding uh, fighting CSAM. 
Um, however, when we talk about the, the CSAM regulation that's been proposed, indeed, um, if you follow the logic of the detection orders, it could be that um, such a detection order could impose um, on-device scanning measures or technologies that we are deeply concerned about, uh, especially because that would undermine the promise of end-to-end -end encrypted uh, messaging services. So we, WhatsApp is already uh, encrypted, it encrypts the content, um, and uh, we plan to do the same thing for um, our other messaging services. Uh, and we believe that such uh, technical uh, solutions would yeah, simply undermine the protection and the benefits for society of end-to-end -end encryption, uh, which is not helpful and it would undermine the trust that people have in um, being able to communicate in a, in a secure way uh, with others. Um, so, yeah, that being said, I think it's, um, yeah, there, there are several risks uh, involved as well that have been highlighted by the LIBE committee uh, impact assessment. So there's an additional risk for fraud and for hacking, uh, etc. that should also be uh, taken into account. Um, however, it's not black and white. So I think this debate is often seen as very, like it's either on device scanning or nothing and you don't care about fighting CSAM. So, in our case, um, it's, it's the contrary. We um, have a lot of measures in place um, to, um, yeah, to combat CSAM um, and grooming. Um, however, they are much more going to be built around other types of data. So that could be um, messaging, uh, metadata or traffic data, for instance, uh, or uh, user behavioral signals that we get from people's behavior on uh, Instagram and, and Facebook. Uh, actually, perpetrators often give of way more signals than they um, maybe think or they think that might not be picked up. Um, and for instance, there's user reports. So also on WhatsApp, uh, people can flag that um, violating content has been shared within their group or in their um, messaging thread with, with someone else. And then um, the end user, basically, the, the one who flags that, would send us a copy of that content, right? So that is a way for us to know that uh, a violation has been taken place. And that is not um, the same as installing software that would basically um, scan everyone's content before it's been uh, sent out. So that's much more uh, proportionate. Um, yeah, and I think, um, yeah, with, with that, I also would like to highlight the importance of prevention. It was mentioned before, so this is very much on the detection side of things. Um, but one example of um, user behavior that we could do much more with is based on um, um, messaging traffic data. So, for instance, an older man um, reaching out to several minors in a row, and then we can, that that's, um, uh, partly uh, traffic data, and if we combine that, for instance, with information about, okay, are these messages often being ignored, or is this person being blocked by the minor, then that is a clear indication that we should take preventative measures, uh, such as introducing a composer block for this um, um, older man to n simply not be able to reach out to minors anymore. But this is purely prevention stuff. This is to make sure that harm cannot happen in the first place. Uh, so this, is, this won't be used for any reporting to law enforcement, for example. For that, you really need to have the hard evidence. But we believe that this prevention work is uh, increasingly important and should be much more also the focus of um, this regulation. So in name, the proposal mentions prevention, but we don't really see it, right? And in the uh, Liebe report of Rapporteur Zorzo Lechels, uh, there's also mentioned that if we go down the route of detection orders, it should also apply to metadata. Um, so we believe that that is, um, that is uh, progress in our view. However, um, we are still concerned that um, there is still room for on-device scanning to, in the end, be implemented or uh, imposed on uh, messaging services. Thank you. Thanks a lot for this view. And uh, speaking about uh, additional measures uh, that are also currently being discussed a lot, uh, Luisa, what is your take on um, 
age verification measures, preventing children from actually accessing uh, certain websites? Uh, and yeah, what, what, what is your opinion? Okay. Being the last to answer is good because I can take hints from the other speakers and then uh, try to say something whom that makes sense. Um, to answer to your question, uh, Teresa, I will refer to the title of this panel, which is Ending the Privacy of Those We Are Supposed to Protect or Safeguarding Them from Abuse. And I would, uh, and I would add uh, abuse, sexual abuse, danger, risks in general. And this is the point. I mean, this is the, the, the real issue. And I'm speaking as a lawyer because uh, after this, I will tell you something else, speaking, speaking as a mother. Uh, this is the point because um, children, teenagers, children, have their right to privacy. Uh, in uh, 1989, the New York uh, Convention for the Children's Rights stated for the first time ever that uh, children have the right to privacy uh, it was the first time that uh, children were uh, treated as a subject of rights, not only objects of rights. So not only uh, people that uh, for their weakness and for their particular status uh, must be protected, but people who have their own rights and can stand for their own. So privacy is a right of children, also of children, but privacy is not a... Uh, um, is not an absolute right. Uh, this we know it. Uh, uh, the uh, National Authority, Data Protection Authority, have stated this uh, in many, many occasions. So, mm, and not, not only the data protection authorities, but also, for example, in Italy, we have uh, mm, um, we have uh, pronunciations of the Supreme Court that state that that state that uh, uh, parents uh, have the duty, the right, uh, and the duty and the right together to control their children also were under the in online activities. So um, putting some uh, age verification tool and possibility to restrict uh, children to some website, access to some website, uh, it is surely a good measure of uh, safeguarding them from abuse and from danger. But on the, other, on the other hand, it can restrain a lot their universal recognized uh, privacy rights. So the thing is balancing two different, two opposite, uh, two opposite rights and two opposite uh, um, need of, uh, of children. Uh, I'd like to refer what Arda and Alexander said before. Arda said that children are sexually curious. I would say they are curious, full stop. Not only sexually curious. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, they, they want to go online, they want to stay online, they want to see the world, they want to, 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 to be um, uh, older and mature, they want to be the grown up. So, and, um, and what Alex said before, that we didn't, we, we didn't invent anything new. These issues, these problems are like as old as the world itself. Uh, technology is not uh, the issue, technology or social network are not the, the monster we want, we want to fight, we have to fight. It's just another mean of communication and another mean where dangers and where abuse, sexual abuse, but general abuse can be, can be done. And uh, of course, children are the weaker and the people who mostly need our protection. Uh, so I return to, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I repeat myself, but I return to what also Thomas said and Arda said, awareness and prevention are our most uh, powerful weapons uh, because we cannot use technology and social network uh, as a Mary Poppins, as a, a nanny. Uh, so, and now I'm speaking as a mother, not only as a lawyer, I have an 11 year old son and uh, he's a very um, unlucky guy, unlucky boy, because uh, he has uh, me as mother, so <laughs> he, can't do anything he cannot uh, access, uh, uh, he, have, he has very limited access to the web, uh, and, uh, but luckily he's in a phase where uh, there only football exists, so I'm quite, uh, I'm quite uh, serene from this point of view. But 
he always says, but my friends have a smartphone, my friends have uh, uh, access to Instagram, to the social, and I'm like, okay, your friends are, have, uh, are lucky because they are different parents and different mothers, so I'm sorry for you. But I think it's, this, it's about prevention and awareness. Uh, awareness uh, that an education that must be done on children and on parents, and parents and teachers. Thank you so sorry. much. And I, I think... Uh, no, I get carried away. <laughs> no, no, I understand. It's okay. Uh, it's only one minute more. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, this is always a very difficult question and also balance for parents to decide how much and where and how they to educate their children, what kind of access they have to what devices and so on. But again, coming back to the measures, and coming back to a, a survivor, actually. Uh, what do you think, Alex, about uh, less intrusive means and more self-directed measures? Uh, so for example, the possibility to anonymously uh, report uh, abuse uh, for survivors and to send uh, the material, uh, for example, in a hashed form, uh, and then also maybe decide whether or not uh, they would like this to be prosecuted. Yeah, I mean, it's my experience is, is deeply personal. And, and every time I speak on this issue, it destroys me. It literally destroys me. And I've been doing this now for 30 years, right? And I was first, I, 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 was, I was in boarding school and, and I was sexually abused for five years in boarding school. Um, and in 1992, the police phoned me up in my place of work uh, wanting to interview me because they'd received 127 complaints from my school. So I went through that entire traumatic process of reporting, uh, being interviewed by the police, telling my story, and the Crown Prosecution Service in the UK decided not to prosecute because it was too politically embarrassing. So they just shut the school down, right? They shut the school down, the school reopened under a different name about six months later. Um, it took me until 2012 before I then came forward and told my story again, 20 years later to the Guardian newspaper. That led to the conviction of three paedophiles for abuse of 27 boys in my school. And a further two paedophiles who had since died were also convicted posthumously. Right? The problem isn't that the, 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 the situation that we have at the moment, if we look at the title of, 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 the, of the hearing here, the online sexual abuse, this isn't online sexual abuse. The abuse has already occurred. We're not stopping children from being abused by preventing the distribution of the images of the abuse. We're stopping further abuse because obviously that's you know, causing uh, a further issue for these, for these children and as they become adults, et cetera, et cetera. But the abuse has already occurred. We're not stopping children from being abused. I want children to stop being abused. And I want us to focus on stopping children from being abused. So technology that we're using to try and deal with the consequences of that is not dealing with the cause of that at all, at all. And it never will. And we're going to continue to see people traumatized. We're going to see lives destroyed. I've been estranged from my family since I was 12 years old. And still, three years now, on this issue, at the European Parliament and the European Commission, I've given countless speeches, I've written countless articles, and every single time it tears another strip off me. And I have to do it because somebody has to do it. Somebody has to understand why this privacy is so important. Somebody has to understand what the actual impact is on the individuals, on these victims, on these survivors. And we keep sweeping it under the rug because it's too politically sensitive or it's too taboo. Just in the last couple of weeks, we've seen in the US, the Catholic Church has been discovered as uh, over 1,600 cases over a, sh over a short period of time in one state. And this is just the stuff that's been discovered. So as much as I support alternative methods to try and deal with this problem and to try to deal with the issue of the distribution and dissemination of child sexual abuse material, it's, a, it's the tip of the iceberg as to what actually needs to be done to stop these children from being hurt and stop lives being destroyed. We're not holistic. We're dealing with consequences because it's too difficult to consider the reality. I've been called out by John Carr, who's trotted out by the, European, by the UK government um, pushing this agenda for more surveillance on Twitter, accused of being off my meds because I was calling for the privacy and the dignity of abuse survivors. This is somebody who is the pinnacle of, of the PR campaign by the UK government, 
with the sole purpose of increasing their surveillance powers, not to protect children, to increase their surveillance powers. We're lying about what the governments are trying to do here. We're not creating any effective legislation. We're not stopping any of this harm from occurring. We're making the matter worse because we're going to push it into other environments where it's more difficult to detect, as we just discussed. So I fully support trying to get rid of this material online. And as you said in your, in your earlier intervention, you know, that's what should happen. This isn't what's happening. The material doesn't get removed. It gets reported, but it's still being disseminated, right? As soon as an image is discovered as, as matching a hash or some other technology which is used to detect these images, it should be destroyed, it should be removed to prevent further dissemination of that material. As Thomas said, six videos made up the vast majority of, of, of a situation for them in regards to the, the data that they were uh, uh, submitting to, 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 the, to the US authorities as a result of the resharing and resharing and resharing of this information. So the statistics are being used to meet an agenda as opposed to solve the problem. And I want to see the problem solved. And I don't want to spend the next three years bursting into tears in front of a room of people because I have to relive this trauma every single time. So let's do something about it. I'm very, very sorry. Well, thank you so much uh, for sharing this with us. Uh, and. Uh, I also hope that you will not have to go again and again through this trauma. Um, speaking about this over-reliance uh, on technology and that it will not help uh, solving these kind of problems and structural issues uh, of the survivors, Ida, in your, in your opinion, would this proposal, the proposed rules, actually lead to better cooperation uh, between hotlines, between child organizations and the authorities, between those and service providers, and then eventually lead to better solutions? Um, I, uh, well, it, it, so far it hasn't. <laughs> it has only put us uh, further apart, I think, uh, within In Hope, um, which is the branch organization for all the hotlines in the world. And there are very um, diverse opinions, let's say it that way. So it's very hard to, to find each other and support each other in, in this proposal. Um, I'd just like to emphasize something that's been said by, by Alexander, because um, actually this week, one of the hotlines from Albania reached out to the network um, to say that they are very worried about this proposal because indeed they will believe that it will um, um, drive the bad actors to the Balkan countries which are who are not part of the European Commission or European Union so they don't fall under this legislation and they by far don't have any means yet very good means to combat this um, this phenomenon or that the hotlines don't even have enough means so they they really think that it will be counterproductive uh, to them as well uh, and I think, uh, I, I, I'm just going to be honest, I really don't think this, this proposal will be helpful in any way to combat uh, any form of child sexual abuse. Um, it's, it's too narrow, it uh, doesn't consider the diversity of the form of abuse, it doesn't consider the diversity of the platforms that are being used, uh, and all the other efforts that platforms might be doing or could be doing like the, the things that uh, Thomas mentioned, there are, will be illegal after this le legislation. So it's, it's a very narrow-minded proposal, um, uh, totally uh, being spinned by an organization from the United States who claims to be an NGO combating child sexual abuse, but really actually is a technical company selling solutions. Um, so no, I don't think this will bring us where we need to be. Uh, and it should have been because I, I do believe that uh, what we didn't do as a hotline, and that's been something that, that's been bothering me for a couple of years now, is we, we, we don't want to think innovative, right? Because the hotlines basically wait until they get a report and then they uh, give a notice and take down um, um, a removal request, and that's it. Uh, there are not many, there, there, there haven't been many initiatives or innovative, uh, innovative ideas coming from the hotlines. And that's also, again, because of the way that they're structured, uh, the tasks that they have, the funding that they get. So it, it, it could have been a good 
um, incentive to start a discussion, but it hasn't been. It's only uh, have, has a strong polarization. You said in the beginning you couldn't find any organization who is a... I, I would like to say... It's difficult. Not, oh, uh, well, it, it's very interesting that these organizations, because there are many, they just, every once in a while, you can see them on LinkedIn, like 150 organizations, child rights, saying this legislation should now be here because it's going to end. Uh, but they won't come here because they don't have the arguments. They only have the emotions. And if you if you dive into the proposal, you can see uh, this is not this is just not the solution. And it's a shame because it will put us back five years on what what is really needed. It's just hampering. It's not helping. It's hampering. Well, thank you so much for uh, this opinion, for this perspective, and and uh, view of the time. Uh, I would like to ask Alexander whether you would still like to yes. have the last opportunities to speak before we uh, open the discussions also with the audience, and whether you have any predictions for the future of this proposal, um, also in light of the developments and what you might have also heard about the uh, Spanish presidency and their um, intentions regarding this proposal, and what this could mean for the negotiations. I mean, Basically, you're all being lied to. Okay, This is not about protecting children. This is about extending surveillance capabilities. It's always been about extending surveillance capabilities, and it always will be about extending surveillance capabilities. We just ha have a document which was published in, in Wired magazine just this week uh, with the Spanish government calling for a complete ban on end-to-end -end encryptions and communications um, uh, to, to deal with this issue of, of, of child abuse. Um, and as, as I've already explained, it's, it's not effective. And I think everybody else on the panel has, has done exactly the same thing and they've created or, or presented some really uh, important and, and, and very honest arguments to support that. Uh, we've got the, the council, the, you know, the council legal services just recently produced a document, um, as we've heard um, uh, today, which has stated that this is illegal. There's no way this will pass muster under EU law. We've got the, 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 the retired judge from the Court of Justice saying exactly the same thing. We've got other opinions from, uh, from impact assessments, which essentially say the same thing. You know, everything is pointing to the European Commission saying this is illegal. This will not sit under EU law. This will be challenged. This will be defeated. And then we're back at square, square one again. So we've wasted all that time. We've wasted all this energy. We've wasted all this money. We've gone back five years. Yeah, exactly. right? it's, an, it's an agenda. It's a political agenda. It's not there to try and protect, uh, to protect kids. Okay? And I need you all to understand that. Because I'm sick of being told, and I'm sure everybody else who's been fighting against this is sick of being told that we do not care about children being abused. We bloody well do. And that's why we're doing this. Because we want to make sure that these children are served appropriately by the law and that they're not used as an excuse for a political agenda. Thank you so much. And please uh, join me first uh, with a round of applause for our speakers. And with that, I would like to uh, open the floor uh, for questions, uh, comments by the audience. Please feel free to use the microphones. And please also introduce yourself and where you're coming from. Thanks a lot. Hi, uh, my name is Andrea Lisievich, much like Alexander, which I know. Uh, I work and live in Sweden. I'm also a lecturer at the Maastricht University. And um, I wanted to see what you guys think about um, another reliance on technology that I see in this field, which happens to be um, actually a Swedish company that I had the misfortune to do a DPIA on, called uh, NetClean, which is a B2B tool meant to be purchased and implemented by companies to detect child sexual abuse material on work computers. And um, the way it works is just horrible in the sense, and I'm, I'm sure they're not the only ones, but the way in which it works, it's horrible because it scans everything, including your personal email that you open on that computer. And it's not limited to things that you haven't marked as personal. It's not limited to a certain time. It's not limited to your work uh, email. It's, it's not limited in any way. And also the default settings are that they do not open up the material that is flagged to other people. That's supposed to be a, a protection. They just 
flag it automatically to law enforcement. So um, when I flagged the lack of necessity and proportionality on this, I was met with the business telling me, but we want to be the good citizen. And the police expects us to do that. So on to you guys, thank you. I, I mean, needle in a stack of needles, right, Andre? It's, you know, as you said, the more of these reports that get filed as a result of, of this technology, and we will see, as this is rolled out, we will see billions of reports being filed because they're not going to be generated by humans. They're going to be generated by technology, which can submit hundreds of thousands of these uh, reports a second. And they're going to be scanning tens of billions of communications a day. The false flags alone, if we look at the error rate on this, that results in many hundreds of thousands of false reportings every single day that have to be weeded through. It's going to destroy lives. We know this from the statistics that already exist, from the limited amount of scanning which is permitted under the derogation. It's only going to get significantly worse as we move forward. And technologies like this, as you, as you said, Andrea, and as was said earlier uh, uh, by my colleague here, these are not altruistic companies. They're there to make money, right? One They're producing the this technology to make money. One of the flags that they actually had was for the album art of Nirvana's In Utero. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which we all know it is a baby, a yeah. naked baby. That was a false flag. Yeah. That's really interesting, actually, because it Net is. NetClean it is. itself is not allowed to watch these images. So they have to rely on hash databases that are being given to them. And, and that could be problematic also. I think in general, if you look at the uh, companies, private companies who are, are claiming to um, enhance the security of, of big companies, um, I think lots, lots of the things that they do are not really all complying within the law, but who's going to complain once you have a perpetrator catch caught or something? But um, I, I don't think Again, this will solve the problem. If you're a real perpetrator, you won't have those kind of images on your working uh, computer, and you will also not use your working computer to access your private email. Most probably, you find some images somebody has been viewing, which is an, an event in itself, but if we would have to lock up all the people who are viewing these images, I think we could uh, really use a country of its own <laughs> to, because there's so many people doing that. So it's, it's not really productive. Cool. Uh, I think that acting for the greater good, so we want to be the good guys, yeah. it could be uh, very dangerous and we've, we've seen uh, many times what, what were the results of acting for the greater good. And uh, I wanted to add, uh, um, referring what to what Alexander said before, that uh, um, the, the problem is that uh, fighting children abuse, children sexual abuse online in my opinion, must be done offline. I mean, uh, we, we don't have to um, uh, invent anything. We, we don't have to uh, produce uh, laws and regulations and enforcement that uh, are not really there to um, protect kids, uh, but just to control and to have uh, meanings, uh, meanings to control. Now, uh, social network are public enemies number one, and technology seems to be really the, the real big issue, but this is not like this. So I think we should return offline and starting from offline to fight problems. Thanks a lot, there's another question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you. Okay, yeah, it's just a light like, comment. Uh, my name is Ridwan. I co-founded uh, Technology Policy Advisory firm that is African Focus. I'm also a master's student at Tilburg University. And what I'd like to say is that uh, I think sometimes the bigger impact of proposals like this often get missing um, because of um, sometimes what we've seen is it also empowers other governments to toe that line. I'm uh, talking about governments who already have history of um, rights of suppressing or right suppression. So it emboldens them because they only make reference, you see them make reference, oh, you've seen this been done in another part of the world. And why I say this is because uh, a couple of months ago I was reading a story about um, a mother who was trying to report or who was trying to share details of the um, cervical region of the, the son who had like some sort of like an infection. So the picture was shared and the picture was flagged. So context get missing in these things. And it's all sweeping and all. So, and it goes back to some of the things that have been said already. We have something that is fundamentally broken, and we are basically just trying to automate a broken thing. 
And what we get, it's something that is uh, an automated broken thing is what we get at the end of the day. And um, the last thing I would say is, um, just to give an example of how impact of things really have, it has like a big app impact outside of the European Union, for example, is I'm an anti-graft agency where I come from, um, decided to deploy technology, for example, in solving crime, anti-graft crime. So basically all you have to do is um, you pick up a mobile phone, you download the, the mobile application, and then you literally can just record or film or send a picture and upload to them. And that's it. It's all it takes for them to start investigation on anyone. And then we funded this litigation against the anti-graft agency, why it's such an horrible idea, because that's not just a problem. The problem is also, when you do like a technical analysis of the mobile application that has been downloaded over 10,000 times, by the way, you also find out that it's also embedded with software development kits that were sharing data with advertisers. And these were the things we were telling the court. And one of the defense they pulled was that, oh, you guys are actually challenging us because um, you're trying to protect yourself and your friends who are involved in you know, anti-graft issues. And the case is coming up for judgment sometimes next month. Um, so the point I really want to make is, I'd just like to take the, the panelists, because again, beyond quick wins, or what, it, what you can call quick wins that you know, whoever it is behind these proposals are pushing, it's also thinking about the bigger impact of things like this, how you embolden authoritarian regimes to want to do more and you know, legitimize more rights suppressing and surveillance. So but thank you to everyone on the panel. Thank you. Thanks thank a lot you. for thank this you. comment. If, if I can, because uh, yeah. this is one of the things I'm really afraid of with this. We didn't talk about the grooming yeah. part. Yes. You can scan for text. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to go to outside the European Union. We have inside the European Union countries who actually feel that Jews shouldn't talk about uh, LBTQ uh, plus. Uh, so they can easily use this to scan to see whether there's a conversation going on uh, and they can again criminalize you. So it's it's really bad idea. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't get to ask you the question no, about the grooming part, but... Uh, I made my point. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> okay, please go ahead first, the first mic and then the second. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Ella Jakubowska from European Digital Rights. Uh, thank you so much for these really um, amazing insights and particularly Al Alexander for sharing that with us. I think it's a real shame that uh, DG Home weren't here to hear about um, you know, how survivors feel about their proposal. Um, my question is relating more to something that Thomas said earlier um, about metadata. So you kind of mentioned that the protection of uh, the confidentiality of the content of communications is really important for meta, um, and that's great, but we know, in, you know under EU law we can look at what the Court of Justice has said, we can look at the European Court of Human Rights, and they say that metadata can be equally sensitive and needs to be protected. It can give away a huge amount of information and has... Uh, you know, arguably equal capacity for mass surveillance. So I'm just wondering why Meta chooses to see the content and the metadata differently um, and kind of what that means to you. And also happy to hear if other panelists have a view on that too. Maybe we can take this question because it's a coffee break afterwards. So maybe we have two more minutes, but uh, you can start. Great. Um, no, thank you for that question. I think Indeed, it's, it's a, a balance, right? Um, where And where do you draw the line? And we believe that the line is indeed at protecting the end-to-end -end encrypted uh, content. Uh, whereas we believe if you use the, the, the traffic data in a very targeted way and in line with uh, the Court of Justice requirements, right? And, and this will also have to be um, um, discussed in the trajectory of getting to a detection order if we, in the end, go down that route. Uh, or of how to do that specifically. Uh, so we recognize that that has to be in a very targeted uh, way as well. Uh, but we do believe that if we have to make a choice, we would rather work with um, metadata that are so specific. For instance, the example that I gave, right? The, the uh, older men reaching out to lots of minors, like if we can target it to those specific examples that could give us um, the tools to prevent, and we have been discussing prevention, I think uh, in this panel to actually do that work uh, and otherwise we won't be able to do that. Um, so for us that would be a way of, of balancing it if you have to choose but in the end um, if you want to do some safety measures you also have to use some data points so you can't really take these measures without any data right so we, we believe that that's um, a good line to draw. Thanks for that question. Thanks a lot. You wanted to add something? No. no? Okay. Then uh, the question. Uh, Cold, University of Luxembourg. Um, 
I'm sorry if possibly the question goes beyond CSUM and its evaluation, but let's imagine CSUM doesn't come and we also have to look beyond uh, and, and, and what other measures may be in place. And there's two elements, and I think with your expertise, maybe you can answer that. Number one is I had the impression several of your um, comments, the actual perpetrators and the first sharers, are they really so tech savvy that, because the impression that I got was they know how to circumvent and to make sure it cannot be traced back to them until now I had the impression rather that a lot of these perpetrators actually would be so dumb stupid to maybe put it on their, luckily, a work computer or quite obvious. So the first question is, is there a high level of technical competence which makes it very difficult to get them? Because that may also be an answer to how should we properly create a legislative framework. And the second is maybe much more difficult because you, two of you said the internet is not the space for kids to be hanging around and being nosy by themselves. Okay? Since the reality is that at the moment, uh, maybe not all parents can manage to <laughs> check out what they're doing. What about if the answer will be, well, then we have to be more strict about age verifications. We have to install systems to make sure that 12-year-olds are not uh, visiting websites where possibly pornographic content, which then later may lead to worse content, is, is shared. Is that the answer? Is that a possible um, way forward. I come from media law background, you know, good old television where it was easy to do that. But the question now is, that would be the alternative, right? Age verification limitation. So those two things I would be interested in hearing your points. Can I respond? Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> we all, I'm going to do it very short, shortly. There's something else uh, within the age verification. It's called parents. So <laughs> and I think you can elaborate on that. Uh, and age verification can be a solution. Uh, but it's way not there yet. It also has very uh, many flaws, so it's not a solution at the moment. And I do want to shout out to all the porn sites because you were talking about sexualizing children, which we do in ads and everything. But you go on angry your regular porn site and it's full with uh, teens, teens, teens. And then they would say, yeah, what's 18 plus? Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> we really have to start the discussion with the adult industry who, who are uh, part of this uh, problematic situation. Uh, but to come to your first question, um, the, again, it depends on what, what is child sexual abuse. Because we're not talking about child sexual abuse here, we're actually talking about the material. And the material is very diverse. If you talk about the real abuse in the networks, which is now on the dark web, but uh, as lately we see, it's, it's removing to the clear web because police is very much uh, at the dark web. They're trying to uh, they figure that out, so they go back to the clear web. They, they try everything and to prevent that they're being caught. But of course, if I'm a 14-year-old boy, I got a photo from a girlfriend, um, my, I send it to my best friend, who then sent it to his best friend, and now it's out there. You know, and, and that's, of course, there's a lot of material we talk about, uh, like uh, which Thomas said, a resharing of the material. So these are indeed shared uh, by very easy ways. And these are the images you will also find of the computer of the work environment. But these are not the real perpetrators who is going to end the violence. It's, it is something we need to talk about, and let me end by saying that. I really feel if you all go home tonight, please talk to your friends, to your children, everybody. Why are you actually sharing that image? There is this whole idea, once the image is out there, you, you lose all the rights to that image, and you can freely share it. I hear boys say, well, she shouldn't have made that picture. I can share it now. I got it. I can share it. She, she made it. This whole idea, we need to change that narrative and it's all up to us when we go home tonight to start that conversation with everybody because it's not just the kids sharing, it's everybody. I would like Can to I just uh, allow for the last question okay. and then if there's still one more I'd like to add something then. about age verification. Um, hi, thanks very much for this um, brilliant session, by the way, especially to Alexander. Um, you shouldn't have to bear your soul like that, but um, thank you. Um, so, sorry, my name is Olga Cronin and I'm from the Irish Council for Civil Liberties. Um, and I just, it's actually not a question, it's just to um, give some figures that we got last year and presented last year, just to, it kind of speaks to some of the points made previously about other by speakers in, in relation to referrals and just the kind of, you know, the lack of detail around those. So um, just to say the Irish police have been receiving referrals from NECMEC -NEC since 2010. Yeah. Um, and at least in the case of 2020, there were just over 4,000 referrals. And of those, 11% were deemed not to be CSAM by the guards. Um, and fewer than that, uh, less than that, um, less than 10% were actionable. Now, the, figure, the referrals that were not 
deemed not CSAM by the guards included pictures of children in the beach, the bath, these kinds of pictures. Yeah. Um, but just for people in the room, for your knowledge, the Irish police have been retaining personal data from all referrals. Um, and it, they wouldn't respond to our further questions in respect of that. But when we put those figures out into the public, they did tell the press that um, one of the reasons that they're retaining it, that the, the personal data, bear in mind, for the, the people that they themselves found to be innocent um, or had no case to answer, um, they admitted that they were retaining that data as reference and intelligence material in respect of future investigations. Um, so I just wanted to share that with people who may not know that in the room because um, not a lot is known about those referrals. Thanks a lot. I think it's, it's important to also actually then hear about the actual numbers that do exist and to uh, draw some attention to those. But uh, since we still have one minute time. Just 30 seconds. Uh, about age verification, uh, uh, you said, uh, can't, can't age verification be the answer? I think it can, it can be one answer, but it cannot be the answer. And I think the only approach that can work in this, in this matter as a uh, internet not being a safe place uh, for children to wander around uh, unattended is uh, what we could call an holistic approach. So, uh, and we, could, we should involve uh, people from different backgrounds, uh, uh, technical people, so age verification, all the privacy enhancing technology, lawyers, so all the laws and all the prescriptions and regulations and whatever, psychologists, because uh, I think the um, psychologist's uh, point of view and uh, the effect that can have, I know I said 30 seconds, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but so this is the, what, what I, what I, when, I, when I talk about holistic approach, I mean, uh, uh, multi-layer approach. So age verification, yes, but not only, not alone. Sorry. Well, I think uh, this is a very good end to this panel. And um, once again, thank you so much to these speakers. Uh, thanks to the audience that you came, even though it's a Friday and it's afternoon and it's nice weather, actually. Uh, but once again, uh, a big applause to my speakers. <laughs>